Hey everyone and welcome back. Uh, in this video I want to talk about some things that I learned after LACTF from reading write-ups and going back and solving a couple of challenges, uh, things that I think would be useful for future CTFs or just good techniques that uh, people should know. Um, the first one is, uh, turns out most people didn't solve JSON web token the correct way. This was a challenge by R2UU. Um, they messaged afterwards saying that uh, the correct solution actually, or the intended solution, not the correct solution, the intended solution uh, involved a uh, uh, throwing errors because when you convert from integer to string, uh, if the integer is over like 4,300 characters long or something like that, Python will crash. And so using this, you can actually leak out the secret token. Um, and so this technique seems very useful. Um, and R2U also mentioned, and I agree, that it most likely you could use this to probably cheese a couple of crypto challenges. Um, um, so I want to talk about that one. So that'll be first. Uh, the second one is the Pwn Flipma challenge. I went back and finally solved it. Uh, this involves some bit flips, and we're going to do some FSOP to get arbitrary reads. And then I use this as a chance to play with exit handlers um, and do some pointer demangling and reading off FS based. Um, so I'll talk about that. Uh, and that one was by EnzoCut. And then the last challenge uh, thing I want to talk about, uh, also by R2U. Uh, another one of his challenges was quick style. And so this was a CSS injection attack uh, with a twist where you have to do some DOM clobbering. Um, but there were two popular methods, one by Strelik and Arc. Uh, I think the one Strelik did was the official solution where we're going to do the CSS injections and leak some trigrams and bigrams um, to recover the token. And then there was a method by Arc where they abused the cache to go forward and backwards and leak the token one by one. But because uh, the certain elements on the uh, page are cached, uh, the token isn't refreshed. Um, so just an interesting technique. Um, I'll link, uh, so like I said, I read, I didn't solve these. Um, and this, the, or one of them I did solve, but it was not the intended solution. And these two I did not solve. I'll leave all the write-ups um, down below if you prefer written text from the people that are actually smart. And with that, let's get started. So up first is Web JSON Web Token by r 2 u 2 um, so in this challenge, uh, the way I solved it and other people solved it is uh, we passed not a number into this user info age field. And by doing this, uh, we corrupt the salted secret. And so we don't actually have to know what the secret value is because it's just going to be not a number. And so when it's converted to a string and hashed, uh, obviously we know what the not a number is. It's not a number and we control data. So we're able to kind of uh, forge our own tokens. Um, but it turns out this was not the intended solution. Uh, the intended solution uh, involves um, a info leak with a peculiarity of Python. And that peculiarity is that it'll only convert integers to strings that are less than 4,300 digits. Um, and to see what this looks like, let's define a integer that's 4,300 digits uh, like this. Um, so we can mess with integers this large in Python. Python doesn't care, but it does care when we try to convert it to a string to print it. Um, we can see we get exceeds the limit 4 to 300 digits for integer string conversion. Um, and so we can print it if it's less than that. So if it's one less digit, so uh, 4,299 digits, uh, that's totally fine. But like I said, it will not print something that, or convert to string, something that is 4,300 digits. Um, so abusing this fact, um, so if we were to go back and do the challenge, uh, we can see when we get an invalid token and when we actually get an exception thrown. We have two different cases. And so using this, this is our kind of like our blind info leak, we can uh, fully recover the secret, uh, this secret right here, and then we can forge whatever token we want. So uh, what we're going to do is we can pass uh, user info um, timestamp to be zero or something like that. We don't really care. So we're just doing secret plus user info. So to do this algorithm, uh, we could start with a high bound and a low bound, somewhere around that 4,300 digit sort of count. And uh, we're just going to take the midpoint, and we're going to check and see if that either crashes or it's an invalid token. If it crashes, uh, we know that the user info age is too large. And uh, so we're just going to subtract a little bit and uh, define that as the new bounds. And so we're going to take that midpoint, then we're going to go to the new midpoint. We're going to see if it crashes or not. Um, and we're just going to continue the cycle until we hit an exact number. And that number... Uh, or 4,300 digits minus that number is what the secret is. And so from there, we fully recovered the secret. And the reason, again, it crashes is because we're converting this into a string. And that string conversion happens right here. So this would be, you know, like 4,300 digits long, so like four kilobytes long. Um, but yeah, it's just when it gets converted right here, it's where it actually crashes. Um, but it seems like a very useful technique. I could imagine there's got to be a crypto challenge or two that we could cheese uh, using this strategy. Um, anytime we're converting a large int into a string or, you know, we pass some user controlled data and we can pass in a large integer, uh, maybe we can, you know, leak some uh, secret values somewhere. Um, but just thought it was a neat, a neat, a neat technique. So uh, thank you, uh, R2U, for uh, pointing that out. So the next challenge is Pwn Flipma uh, by EnzoCut. This was the FSOP challenge. Um, so if we take a look at the challenge, uh, what's going to happen is uh, we get to flip four bits. 
Uh, and these four bits that we get to flip, we get to control uh, the offset and the specific bit. And these bit flips are offsetted from standard in. Uh, and so this exists within libc. Um, I guess this is a pointer to a, a structure in libc. Um, and like I said, we just get four bit flips and somehow doing this, we have to get shell. There's no return to win or anything like that. Um, so a pretty fun challenge. Uh, the, I think the first stage, everyone kind of solved it the same way. Um, we're just going to be doing some FSOP. I don't think there's any way to get uh, four bit flips into um, just shell without doing more flips. Um, so the first thing people want to do is kind of flips this uh, or add some more counts to this flips variable. And to do that, you have to leak both the uh, libc and the base of the uh, flipma binary. Um, to do this, uh, the popular technique is fsop, uh, which is what everyone did. Um, once you have arbitrary flips, uh, it's pretty easy and you have your two leaks. Uh, there's a variety of methods you could use to get shell at that point. Um, the way I ended up doing it was uh, playing with exit handlers, which is a little bit overkill, um, but it was an excuse to play with them. And this, obviously this is after the CTF. Um, so it was fun for me to finally actually do that because I've just only read write-ups about it. Um, we're gonna do some pointer demangling and leak from FS base and stuff like that. Uh, but you could also like leak the stack pointer. I think uh, this is what the official write-up did uh, by Enzo. Um, they were able to leak some stack variables and then you can just write a, a rot payload onto the stack. Uh, because of this fsop primitive, we have arbitrary reads uh, and I guess we, has, we also have arbitrary writes. So you, know, you can do lots of fun stuff with that. Um, yeah, so I guess first for the rest of this, I'm gonna talk about just briefly what is fsop if you've never heard about it before. I'm pretty sure I've talked about it on the channel somewhere, but I don't remember where. Uh, and then I'll talk about the exit handlers and kind of the solution. Um, if you're brand new to all this stuff and you wanna learn more about fsop, I highly recommend Pwn College. Uh, they have a whole module on doing these sort of file structure uh, manipulation attacks, uh, and it's good, and that's where I learned from. Also, uh, write-ups, uh, nobody is nobody. Um, they have a GitHub, and they have a whole bunch of write-ups on this stuff. Uh, there was a fun uh, write-up on Glacier CTF where they did a write byte where um, sort of exploit. Um, but anyway, so FSOP. Uh, what is FSOP? Well, I guess first, why do we care about FSOP? Uh, so these there's these file structs that exist within libc, and they're always there. And because they're always there, that makes them a interesting target for exploitation. You know, it's just nice and consistent. It's like the heap. The heap is there. If you can find an exploitation thing that works in the heap, um, you know, it's still going to work in the heap until they patch it. Uh, and so what's going to happen is uh, the binary. So this flipma binary has uh, symbols ready for standard in and standard out. And normally standard error, but doesn't look like uh, standard error is exported. So when libc eventually gets linked in, uh, libc is going to create these structures for these uh, uh, these file uh or they're just called file structs, uh, and place them within um, the main binary. And what we can use the different uh, file struct APIs, like fgets, for example, or fopen, you know, file open, stuff like that, uh, to read from these structures. Uh, but I guess, why would we even want these structures? Like, we can already read and write using syscalls, uh, which is true. Um, if you remember, we have the read and write syscalls, uh, the very first two syscalls for x86-64. Um, but the problem is that these are a little bit like slow. Um, every time we do one of these syscalls, we have to pass over to the kernel, uh, which can just be you know, a little tedious. We have to put all the variables on the stack. Uh, the, the CPU has to do instructions to enter in a different ring, and then it has to return. And so if you're going to do a bunch of small reads, for example, uh, that's just not very efficient. And so these file structs exist to kind of buffer uh, contents. So you could read like an entire page, like four kilobytes. Um, and then when you, if you're reading like, you know, a couple bytes at a time, it doesn't have to call out to the syst or the kernel every single time. Uh, it can just, you know, return four bytes off of a buffer. Um, and so these are what the file structs look like. Uh, so this is Elixir. Highly recommend uh, getting used to this or another C or libc scanning uh, tool. Uh, but I just use Elixir because it's online and it's easy. You can select uh, the libc version and it has a good search capabilities. Uh, but these are the file structs and we'll take a look at what they look like in a second uh, within GDB. Uh, but this is it. Um, there's two like main parts that we're interested in for exploitation. Uh, these are the different buffer boundaries, which I'll talk about. And there's also vtable. Uh, it's not in this symbol. Uh, but there's also a vtable that's also pretty interesting for exploitation. Uh, a lot of it gets patched, but there's always a new uh, vtable that uh, people can corrupt, it seems like. Um, so the first part of this exploit is we're going to be exploiting these pointers. Um, so we get to write relative to standard in, and from there we can actually find out the, the offset to standard out, and we're going to be playing with these three, uh, I guess, pointers within standard out. And these are the, there's the read base, the read pointer and the read end. So, you know, you're gonna have the base, the end, and then the current pointer. And what's gonna happen is like normally if we're, let's say we're reading from a file, we read four kilobytes. Uh, when we do our first open using, you know, an F read, it's going to fill out this, you know, let's say it's a four kilobyte buffer, fill it all the way with data. And let's say we only request like five bytes. 
it's just going to start it, you know, at the, the base. It's going to read five bytes, so it's going to increment you know, read pointer by five bytes, whatever we want, uh, and return those five bytes. And if we want to read another five bytes, again, it's just, you know, doing some iterating through this buffer super fast. You know, it's just going to increment by five pointers and, you know, return those five bytes. Um, but if we were sneaky and, you know, trying to exploit something, what if we were to move this buffer, th these are just pointers into a buffer, to somewhere else that we find interesting? Like specifically, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to search for a area in libc that has a pointer to the base of flipma because we're specifically looking for a leak to the main elf so that we can find the flips variable so that we can have unlimited flips. Um, and so if we were to change base instead of pointing, uh, default is actually unbuffered, but instead if we we're going to change base to, you know, some arbitrary memory, next time we call read and we're also changing read pointer, um, it'll just start reading from there, uh, which is awesome. Uh, so we can just start reading arbitrary memory. You can also do the same with uh, standard in, um, corrupting these write pointers. You could actually get it to write to arbitrary memory. Um, so two very powerful primitives. And like I said, they exist in... You know, anytime you're using libc, you're going to have standard in and standard out, which is why there's such a uh, ripe target for exploitation. Um, yeah, so I'll we could take a look in GDB. Um, so let me I'm going to quit out of Docker and then go back into a Docker container. Uh, one thing that's important for doing any of these challenges is you want to make sure you have libc and you have symbols for libc. Um, so uh, the Docker container was uh, or the Docker file was given, so you can download the Docker version, which I, I think I show in one of the challenges for LACTF. Um, so we have the Docker thing. Uh, one thing that's annoying is we don't I don't think we have all the symbols for some reason. Um, Clip my patched. If we go here, we run, we cancel, we try to print standard out. It says it doesn't know its type. Um, so one way to get around this, maybe there's a better way, is I just go and I find the correct debug package for this libc version. So libc6, we're on 231, Ubuntu. Um, you can take this. Oops, I meant to copy link address. We're going to copy it. We'll get it. It's already downloaded uh, right here if my internet's slow. Then we're going to do a dpackage. We're going to install it. Oops. Uh, it throws some errors, but it now finds the uh, the type, so who knows. Uh, we're going to run, we're going to print, standard out, and now it knows what standard out is, and uh, we can print out all the fields in all of its glory. So much better environment to work in. Um, and you might notice uh, a lot of these look the same that we just saw. We saw the flags, we saw the read pointers, the write pointers, the buff pointers. Um, so everything's here and much cleaner environment to debug in. Uh, cool. So going back to the challenge and like what I said we're going to do. Um, so off the bat, we only get four flips. And for this challenge, uh, four flips is just not enough to be able to spawn a shell. So we want to find uh, um, where this flips exist in memory so that we can flip one of its bits into something high so we get unlimited flips. Um, so to do that, uh, there's a very useful tool, uh, two useful tools, I guess, in Pwndebug for finding good uh, info leak targets. So we can do a VM map to see what we're looking for. And specifically, we're going to look, we want to leak uh, something around this value. What we can do is just grab the first four bytes. So one, two, three, oops. Sorry, I messed that up. One, two, three, four. Uh, I think I have ASLR off. So, I mean, I do have ASLR off, so it's nice and clean, but normally it's not this clean. And what we can do is we can search for these four bytes somewhere. Um, and I think we can even specify libc. Yep, uh, we can even specify libc. And so uh, we, oh, it's a little nasty though. Hmm. Actually, I'm gonna, uh, tmux python3 solve uh, when i run it here uh, aslr is off um cool so if i do vm map uh we're going to be looking for this these first f uh, four bytes one two three four let's see how big i can make this uh not too much bigger but we have the four bytes one two three bb so we're gonna search type or sorry search four bytes ox4 and this is a little bit better. So within these addresses of libc, I can make it a little bit bigger now. Uh, within libc, we can see we have leaks to the base of the elf. So we can take this address and we can subtract, you know, the value or the address of standard out here. And we can find the offset from this to this leak of the base of the flipma elf. Um, and so that is our leak target. And so if we just take a look at the solution, it's not really too exciting, but um, basically I just recorded a bunch of these values. So this was the address of some leak. This is where we currently are for standard out, uh, the base pointer, the standard in addresses. From there, you can kind of calculate the values and you can do some flips. And we're specifically going to flip uh, point standard out. So what we're going to do within standard out is we're going to take IO write base and we're going to put it all the way to where um, that leak value is. 
And so the next time we call puts, we can force a, a puts call in, as part of the program by throwing an error. Um, when it does puts, it's going to see, oh crap, my buffer is full. Uh, I have a bunch of stuff I need to print out. And it's going to print out just a huge dump of contents everywhere from the start of where that leak was uh, to the pointer, I think. Um, yeah, the pointer, because we're filling up the buffer. Uh, and so yeah, we'll get a leak and we'll get like, I think it's like four kilobytes of data that we'll get. And so then from there, we have to sift through and get the libc leak. Um, but yeah, that's how you can do an info leak. As part of that, you also need to uh, overwrite IO read n. Um, this is where I got stuck when doing the challenge. Um, I just was tired and didn't feel like reading through the libc code. Um, but if you go through the libc code, uh, uh, eventually, like if you're going to call puts, um, you're eventually, you just follow the functions through and just kind of go back and forth and see... Uh, like what conditions have to be met for it to actually uh, do its thing. Um, actually, let's just go through here. Uh, we'll break on puts, we'll continue. Um, you can single step, eventually it's gonna call, it's gonna go through this, gonna do the string length, it's gonna call through, and it's gonna actually start calling through the uh, the file operations. So we have IO file X button, uh, whatever this function means. Uh, we'll search for it, we'll go through here. I think it's defined by like new file or something like that. Uh, XO file, I don't know. It's file ops is what we want. But this is redefined to new file and it is defined as a function here. <laughs> so eventually we have the, the real code. Um, like I said, you just have to kind of go through this code and like figure out what flags are necessary for the conditions to eventually flush the buffer. Um, you can try to remember all the tricks, but I think it's just better just to get used to reading this libc code and uh, makes it easier. Eventually we'll call into this IO overflow code. And this means that you know it's time to push out the buffer and do the right. Um, but yeah, so from there, we'll actually get a leak. Um, and once you have the leak, you can start the next stage, which is uh, overriding the slips variable. And once you have unlimited flips, you can start doing fun stuff. Um, so like I said, what I ended up doing was, uh, the, sorry, the official solution was to get a stack leak from this point and start um, uh, writing ROP code onto the stack. Uh, but I decided it could be fun instead to kind of look at the exit handlers. Um, and so when a program exits normally, um, libc has a bunch of function pointers it saves that it eventually calls uh, to clean up stuff like close file descriptors and you know close, maybe close the heap, I don't know, some other stuff that it needs to do. Uh, but there's this array of function pointers. One thing that's tricky though is the function pointers are like uh, encrypted, encoded, I guess. Um, I guess they'd be encrypted. There is a key, so they're encrypted. Um, I think it calls it mangled though. Uh, so you can't just write an address somewhere into libc and have it called. So we can take a look at the exit handler code. We can just go to gdb. Um, we'll do flipma patched. Uh, we'll run. Uh, we need to do a bunch of things. We'll do 100. One, actually, let's cancel. Let's do break on here. So we're gonna break in the libc start main function because eventually this will call the cleanup code. Uh, we'll continue. We're gonna enter in 100 and then zero, 100, zero. We're just running it four times. So eventually we're back into libc and eventually it'll call the cleanup code. So right now we're about to call into exit. Uh, we go through, uh, now we're doing run exit handlers. Um, and so at this point, we're going to start grabbing the, the exit handler functions. You can see there's also this RSI function that has the exit funks. We can actually take this. So let's print out exit functions. Uh, and we can see, um, I think it's best to just kind of read the docs on this um, if you ever need to do it. Uh, but there's a couple different types of exit functions that have different uh, signatures. Uh, like they just accept different arguments. Um, and they're called like this uh, CTX and on and at. Um, and I think it defines like 32 of these. Um, uh, there's 32 slots where you can register exit handlers. And uh, this one is nulled out. And there's, I guess, maybe two here. There's a CXA. I think there's only one. Oh, I think it's a union structure. Um, but I think specifically this is a CXA. And uh, you can see this is would be the function, but it is currently encrypted by some sort. Like this does not look like a function. Um, but we had this address and, uh, specifically we'll, it'll show in a second what it actually does to decode it. Uh, I'm looking for a rotate. Uh, not yet. It's decoding. Don't, not yet. Not yet. 
Okay, here we go. Uh, so this is where it's going to actually start decoding it. So we're gonna grab it, move something that that en encrypted that make old function pointer. We're gonna move it into RDX. Uh, we're moving something into RDI. I'm not sure what. Uh, doing something. Not sure. The first thing we're going to do with RDX is we're going to rotate it right by OX11. So you can kind of see RDX up here, and this is part of the pointer demangling. And then we're going to XOR with this FS OX30. Uh, and so this is the, uh, I think it's part of, I keep, it's like TCB or TLS, thread cache block or thread local storage. Um, not sure the correct terminology, uh, but basically I think it's part of the linker loader process. Um, uh, certain values are put into this like special area and it exists within like the LD. Um, uh, it's one of these uh, memory segments. Um, this is also where the canary, canary is installed, uh, installed if you have stack canaries, uh, but it's just this value that you can use to, uh, I guess, encrypt or mangle um, uh, these function pointers. And you can figure out where it is by using the fs base command. Uh, so we can see it's right here. And if we were to examine a bunch of bytes here, let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, I believe it is. it was 30 bytes off. So this is that uh, key that is used for uh, encrypting or mangling the functions. Like I said, I'm pretty sure this is the canary right here, OX38. Uh, um, you can see this is the canary value, so they do match. So this is the stack canary, it's just not being used. Uh, but anyways, this is that value that is being used. Um, so as part of this uh, exploit, we need to calculate the offset from here uh, to the standard in. Uh, and thankfully it is always a set offset. If we look at VM map, uh, the difference between libc and this ld uh, is like, they're pretty much the same. Um, or they're right next to each other, so it's a constant offset. Uh, but anyways, going back to uh, the code, it's then, it's doing that rotation, and then it's going to XOR with that secret value. And then at this point, uh, we can print out RDX because it's about to uh, call it. Oh. And we can see this is just a, a standard sort of look, libc looking function, and it is the DL finny function, I guess. I guess it would be instructions. And so it's starting with the NBR and branch. Um, cool. So anyways, those are the exit handlers. Uh, like I said, I'd recommend reading like a real guide, but hopefully like it's a nice introduction. So if you want to exploit it, there's a couple things you could do. Uh, one, you could try overwriting, uh, that pointer mangling key with all zeros. And so then when it does that XOR, uh, you don't have to worry about it because it's just XORing with zero. You still have to do that rotate right by, or rotate left because you're doing the reverse, uh, by 11, but you know, that's not too hard to do. And so then you can just overwrite uh, one of those function handlers with your one gadget, uh, which is kind of what I do. But instead I chose to use FSOP again to leak out that specific value so that I have the key. Um, and then from there I encrypt the key and I replace this DL Finney function uh, with the one gadget. So at the very end, it calls one gadget um, to kind of see what this looks like. Um, uh, do to do. So this is the solve script. Um, so this is uh, the very start of the exploit. Uh, we're moving the uh, buffer pointers within the file structure, so that way we can leak some values. Eventually we call puts. Puts will actually call the uh, file operation that'll push all that stuff to uh, um, standard out. And so we receive all that data. Um, if the data is less than 100, uh, since we're doing bit flips, it's not always guaranteed we're gonna go uh, the correct direction. We could go the wrong direction. So if the data is less than 100 bytes, I know it didn't work. Uh, from there, uh, I calculate uh, where the leak is. Um, I grab out the two leaks. Uh, and then from there, we're able to leak the counts variable or the flip count variable so that we have unlimited counts. Uh, from there, we need to leak. So that variable is called the pointer guard um, as part of the TCB struct. Um, and so I grab out the offset to that. Um, from there, to do that, you know, you have to rechange the uh, those pointers within standard out so that it points to the pointer guard structure uh, so that we can uh, leak that value. Um, to do that, I eventually define this function called write to adder. And so this will take a target uh, value. So we want to write uh, the pointer guard address to the pointer uh, buffers within the file struct. Um, and this is their current value. They're all currently pointing at short buff adder. Uh, and then uh, this is the address we want to write there. Um, so, or the address we want to write to these this target value. Uh, but anyways, um, then I uh, load up the one gadget. And so this is the function we're going to mangle and so that we can put it onto the exit function uh, call list. Um, so I take it, this is where I receive the printer guard. Uh, this is the mangling and demangling code. Um, and like I said, it is a rota rotate right or a rotate left by OX11. And then it's also XORed with that key. 
Uh, thankfully, Potent Tools already has an implementation for rotate left and rotate right, which is nice. Um, I take out the current value just because I'm curious of what it is, to just to double check to make sure everything's going correctly. And then I overwrite my one gadget onto the exit handler, and we're set. From there on, I just uh, call... I do the same thing I did in the program. I just, you know, send like some garbage values, some garbage bits until we run out of bits. And at the very end, the exit handler should be called uh, and we win. Uh, I'll put this, I'm gonna uncomment this, uh, but we can run it and take a look. Python three, solve.py. Uh, yeah, the first time it worked, sometimes, like I said, uh, it jumps the wrong way since we're doing XOR, um, but let me make this just one or two smaller. There we go. Uh, so we're at the exit handler now. Uh, so I'm moving the encrypted uh, exit handler onto RDX. Uh, so this is the encrypted uh, handler right now. Uh, then we're, I'm not sure what the RDI value is. Not sure what that is. Not sure what that is. Now we're going to rotate that encrypted function by 11. And then we're going to uh, encrypt it, sorry, uh, XOR with the uh, pointer guard. And so now, RDX should uh, be our one gadget, and we can kind of tell, we can see that RDX is this value, which is going to call into exec CPE, which is uh, one of the one gadget targets. So if we hit continue, uh, we can see uh, shell is spawned, and over here we have shell. Um, so very fun challenge, you know, from FSOP to reading arbitrary memory all over the place to uh, uh, leaking a bunch of different values, and then uh, overwriting, leaking a FS base and a pointer guard and mangling some pointers so that we can, you know, write to the uh, exit handlers. So uh, yeah, just a fun challenge. Uh, the last challenge is Web Quick Style by R2 Uwu2. Um, so this was the CSS injection challenge. Uh, the way it works is there's this website and the website has a one password uh, and we need to be able to leak this password. Uh, specifically, we're gonna give a URL to the admin bot and the admin bot, we need to leak the token for the admin bot and then we can submit it and get the flag. But basically we need to be able to leak this token. Um, our injection point is given to us. Uh, we can specify a page. Um, so well, we could imagine, I mean, this won't work, but you could say google.com and what's gonna happen is uh, this code would execute. It'll grab google.com and it'll put the contents of google.com into this page. Uh, but there's a couple of little gotchas. Uh, there's a couple things. First off, there is content security policy. <laughs> so we can't just blindly inject stuff. Uh, so we can't do font sources. Um, we have done a font ligature attack on this channel. Uh, it was Iris CTF last year. There was a font ligature uh, challenge, which was fun. Uh, so we won't be doing fonts. Uh, we can't do object source, obviously a very juicy target. Uh, same with JavaScript. We can't do a base URI. Uh, we can't do form actions. The only styles are from self. And there's only one uh, script that's being loaded and there's no useful gadgets. Uh, but if we look, we got style source unsafe inline. So we are, this is why it is a uh, CSS injection attack. We're allowed to embed inline CSS. It's important to note that we do not get to embed remote CSS. Um, it's only inline. Uh, normally there's some attacks with the CSS injection where you can chain imports, uh, which you won't be able to do, which, uh, but we'll talk about those in a second. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the challenge. Like I said, we just need to leak this token and we are given a CSS injection. Um, so like I said, I'm pretty sure I've covered it before, but uh, the idea behind this attack is uh, since we can inject CSS, we'll inject something like this, uh, inline style. And what we're gonna do is we're going to match on the input parameter, uh, something like, uh, let's just pretend we're doing this one. Uh, so let's say the token started with an A we're gonna to try to match on it instead of setting background color like it's recommending. We're gonna do, well, background. We're gonna say load URL, localhost 5000, L is equal, sorry, L, and L is equal to A. So we're gonna say, and then close style. Uh, this is a CSS selector and we're gonna match it in a tribute and we're gonna say if the input value, so let's take a look at this, inspect element. If this input value starts with an A, I want you to grab this URL and set it as its background. Uh, but this is an info leak. If it makes this request, we know it's making that request and uh, we can then, we have an info leak and we know what the token starts with. Um, there are a couple of complex things. Uh, first off, this token changes with every page refresh. Um, so we need to be a little bit clever about that. Um, 
And yeah, and that's pretty much where like the cleverness of the challenge comes in, uh, how you're going to get around that. There's one other uh, complication with this challenge, uh, and that is uh, they actually delete all the styles uh, as part of the challenge. Um, this one was uh, easier to bypass. I didn't bypass it during the CTF, though. I got stuck on this. Uh, but now that I see the solution, I'm mad at myself because I know how to do this. I just, I don't know, I was being dumb, I guess. Um, but uh, so here is uh, where it grabs the remote page and injects it into the HTML. So we're going to pass it a URL from the params. Um, it's then going to fetch that URL. It's going to grab the text. If the message is large, uh, it's not going to do it. Uh, and this is fun because it blocks uh, one of the typical solutions using trigrams. Um, and then it's going to take that message content. So whatever, you know, inline CSS we're creating, it's going to do an inner HTML. So, you know, we have a very trivial uh, content injection attack. We just can't execute scripts, only CSS. But then what it's going to do is it's going to do document, query selector all, uh, style, uh, for each, remove. So it is going to remove all the styles from the document, uh, which is crazy. So during the CTF, um, I didn't spend too long on this, but what I tried was just creating a whole bunch of styles. I was wondering if we could get a race condition where like if you defined like, you know, a thousand styles, if the styles would be executed before there's a chance for it to be deleted. Like I wonder, um, yeah, I, I was hoping I tried like creating like very large styles, like to see if it was a timing thing. I couldn't get that to work. Um, but the trick is uh, to actually use DOM clobbering. Um, since we're injecting HTML in here, we can actually redefine query select all uh, so that it is not this function. Instead, it's just a form or a, you can probably do it with like an image or an ID or something like that. Um, there's probably a couple different targets. Um, but basically what that means is um, let's uh, define something. Uh, let's do exploit uh, two.html. If we were to do form name is, zero to, name is equal to query selector all, was it selector? Yeah. Um, this, and this is going to be our page. Well, let me, so I have a ngrok running exploit two. Uh, let's uh, view page source. So this URL is just defining a form name, query selector all. Cool. So if we actually uh, load up, actually we need to go here. If we load up uh, the JavaScript console and we do document query selector all, we might notice that it is no longer the default query selector function, it is now returning this uh, this form. And so this is just what DOM clobbering is. Um, you can insert HTML elements and it'll overwrite variables. Um, normally it only works on variables that are not defined, but I think form is, and there's a couple that are special. I think there's an article on hack tricks that talks about all of them. Um, uh, but yeah, we're gonna redefine what query selector is. And so that way, uh, when it tries to delete all of the styles, uh, this function doesn't actually exist. Uh, and the, it'll uh, it'll get mad or throw or something like that, but we don't really care at that point because we've already injected all of our HTML. Um, so uh, pretty pretty interesting. I uh, forgot about DOM clobbering when I was trying to find a bypass to this. Uh, but anyways, uh, getting back to the CSS trick or the CSS injection. Um, so we can bypass this. We can now inject CSS. And like I said, uh, we want to uh, uh, do something like this where we can leak out the full token. And so we could do this for every character um, we're doing input starts with, you know, then we could do B, B, you know, and then C and C and go all the way through. Uh, but like I said, we're only, right now we're only matching on the start. So we could try doing two characters at a time. We could do AA, AB, AC, and you know, you could probably do three or four characters, but you're very quickly going to hit that six megabyte limit. Um, so you can't do anything bigger. So uh, there's a couple of solutions at this point. Um, I think normally what people do is, uh, there's a tool for it too. I'm forgetting what it's called, but you can do these like long imports. So at the very start of a style, you can do, I forget the, in, the syntax, but I think it's this. Oh yeah, it's going to do it for us. Oops. Yeah, go back, import. And so you could do this, uh, recursive import sort of structure and you could do, uh, I think they're called, uh, long polling where you kind of have a web request that kind of waits at the server. Um, so I think it's like an alternative to WebSockets, not that that matters too much, but um, so what we're going to do is this one way, normally we can't do it for this one because it bans remote style sheets from URL. You can only do inline styles, um, but you would be able to do this where every single call to grab new styles, it'll start with an import and that import will hang until it gets a leak from the previous character and then it'll build a new styles um, to uh, do one of these style chains to leak the next token. So if we knew that the token started with, you know, like F blah, 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 then we would do A and then the same string and then B and the same string and C. We're going to get a leak 
And since we already had this import at the top, that's just waiting. Once we have the leak, the server then eventually responds with another one of these, with another one of these imports, doing this kind of recursive structure where we leak the next character until no more characters are leaked. Uh, and then at that point, you know that you're at the end. Um, so that's one strategy to do things, uh, but we can't do it since we can't leak uh, remote style sheets. We can only do inline style sheets. Um, so one way uh, that's popular is using trigrams. Um, and this is what Strelic did. Uh, and I think it's also the like intended solution. Um, so you could do, uh, instead of doing um, uh, starts with, you can do match. Uh, forget if it's star or squiggly. One second. Let me check. It is star. Okay. Uh, so you can match uh, this. And so this will check to see if the token contains ABC. And so what we could do is we'll construct every three-letter combination of uh, things that could exist within um, the token. And then at the very end, we're just gonna merge all those together. Um, and so to see, I think I called it merge. Uh, what will happen is we'll get something like this, all of these individual little tokens like this, and we just have to write some code at the end that'll merge them all together. And from there we can leak it. Um, and so this is, I think it's called like a shingle, single shot method. Uh, one trouble uh, with this challenge though, is that we can only, we only get six megabytes. Uh, where's that code? Uh, we only get six megabytes and doing all the trigrams. So like A, B, C, our character set for this one is lowercase, uppercase, and numbers. Uh, three of them is, is it's more than six megabytes. I think it was like 10 or 15 or something like megabytes. Um, so we can't do that. So instead, uh, there was uh, Strelic and the intended solution. Uh, a clever idea is you could do all lowercase and number trigrams, and then you could leak the bigrams that are case sensitive. Um, so you could take these, and if you want to, and so sorry, these are going to be case insensitive matches. To do that, you just put an I here, and this means match insensitively. And then for these, we're going to do the case sensitive matching. So we'll have A, 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 capital A, capital A, capital A, capital A, um, you know, capital B. Um, and with both of these combined, um, it is still less than six megabytes. And at the very end, you can merge them all together. Uh, it's not 100% reproducible. Um, I think I got, was getting somewhere like, you know, one in like 20 or something. The official write-up said one in 10. Um, uh, but basically at the very end, you're going to get all these trigrams and these bigrams. The trigrams, like I said, they're case insensitive and the bigrams are case sensitive. What I go through is all the bigrams and I make sure there's no matchings uh, already uh, with the lowers. Because if you do have a matching within the bigram, the same letters, but one's uppercase and one's lowercase, it's too ambiguous. So I just throw it away. Um, and then from there, I just go through and I upgrade all the trigrams with the correct bigram case information. And then at the very end, I just like merge all of them together. This code doesn't work perfectly. So I just shuffle it a couple times at the start and eventually you'll get up the correct token. So it's not perfect code, but it works. Um, so that is one solution using bigrams and tigrams to uh, merge it all out. There's one other trick too. So when you're, if you want to leak multiple things at the same time, if there was both an ABC and an ABD, uh, Chrome would only load one of these because it only wants one background URL, I guess. Um, there is a way to get around this, and that is using background masking. Um, so you can specify multiple, or sorry, background layers. So you can specify multiple URLs like this. Uh, so there's two tricks. First is you specify multiple layers, um, which doesn't sound too useful, but what we're actually going to do instead of specifying, uh, let me delete this. Um, instead of specifying background URL, we're actually going to tag it. I forget the exact word. Um, I could look it up, but there's a word where uh, you, you uh, it's like attribute naming or something like that. We're going to say start B. So we're actually creating a label that will exist when this condition is met. And so then at the very end, what we're going to do is we're going to say on all inputs, uh, background uh, is equal to start, I think, was it value? Uh, I forget. Let me look up the solution real quick. Uh, we don't need exploit two. We don't need merge leaks. We don't need merge leaks. We don't need server. We need app. I think it was this one. Background injector, it's var. Uh, like this. So what we're going to do is, I think I did it with a C. Oops. C. Um, and B. And... This is getting messy, but and we'll put an A here. All right, so when it matches on one of these, well, all we're going to do is we're going to define uh, this, uh, I need to look up the name of it, but this, uh, 
CSS matcher, I guess, until I figure out what the correct name is. Uh, it's going to define the CSS matcher as a valid like CSS entity, I guess, um, that has this value. And so we're going to do these for you know all everything we're interested in matching. And then at the very end, we're going to define this one background with all these layers. And because uh, it'll it, you can download multiple layers. Um, it'll download the ones it needs. And so we're defining var, if this is defined, uh, it'll download it. If this doesn't exist, it's gonna default to none, and so nothing will happen. So if we're matching the CAA, it'll download this URL. If we're matching the CB, it'll match this uh, LB. And from there, you know, we can download multiple things at once. It's just kind of an implementation detail because uh, Chrome won't download all of these unless you do a trick like this. Um, Cool. Anyways, so that was one of the solutions. The other, and that was the Strelic and official solution. I'm sure other people did it too. Uh, Arc also put up a very cool write-up where they abused um, uh, the history uh, and sorry, the caching uh, in browsers uh, to get the same token over and over, uh, and so that they can do this like single character CSS injection, character by character, but use the same token over and over and over. Um, and so the way that works is, I think I have. Exploit history. Uh, this will work, I guess. Um, cool. So let's go to some unrelated tab. So we are on a unrelated tab. And what we're going to do is we're going to open the challenge and we're going to pass it in some garbage, blah, blah, blah. And this is just going to open up a new tab. So it opened up a new tab. The tab, the token starts with RCD, blah, blah, blah. Uh, cool. So we can run our single starts with exploit. You know, does this character start with a, an A, B, a C, blah, 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 all the way to R. It'll leak a token. Cool. So we have our token leak. In this, what we're going to do is we're going to say a.location is equal to about blank. So we're going to scoot the, uh, the history state of this tab forward by one. And then what we're going to do is a.history.back. We're going to scoot it back by one. And we might notice, oh, I actually, let me, sorry. We're scooting it forward by one. I go to this tab. We notice that the URL of the tab is now about blank. So it is, you know, a completely different page. Then when we go back, we'll see that it still has the same token. So this was cached. Um, if you read, I would highly recommend reading ARC's write-up. Uh, they actually talk about a different challenge too, where they go into the differences between BF backward forward cache and disk cache. Um, something about the JavaScript heap, uh, very interesting. In this case, we are on the disk cache. Uh, so the JavaScript heap is not cached. And so we still get the same token, but it's still going to download our remote script and run the exploit. So we can, you know, download character by character. Um, but yeah, just super cool. Uh, I didn't know that you could uh, do something like this and keep a cache sort of thing to leak tokens. Uh, just seems like a very useful primitive. Uh, uh, but anyways, those were the two solutions. Uh, like I said, uh, very cool uh, challenges and just uh, a lot to learn from the CTF. I had a great time and uh, hope you learned something too and I'll uh, see you at the next CTF. Cheers.